A man of action doesn't have to be a swashbuckler in real life. A facility with the written word can be action enough. Anthony Mason now with the fine print. London's Westminster Abbey is where we started with Ken Follett. I mean, when you look at structures like this that have lasted as, as long as they have, centuries, um, you sort of assume that they knew what they were doing. But in a lot of ways, they didn't, did they? No, they didn't. There was a lot of guesswork. And of course, what we see are the cathedrals that did stay up. Some of them fell down. Off to the side of the nave is an old stone stairway. Off limits to the public, it leads up to the Triforium. One of the things I, I was struck by being up here was even though nobody really uses it, architecturally there's still some very intricate detail up here. Yes, and little carvings and so on. Well, it was done as carefully as the rest of the church because God could see it. And From these heights, you can look down on this 700-year-old Gothic wonder and understand what inspired Follett to write The Pillars of the Earth, his epic novel about the construction of an abbey in 12th century England. Where did that first idea come from? Well, it came from looking around a place like this and thinking, why is this here? Uh -huh. It's huge, it's beautiful, it's costly. Why is it here? But the book was a radical departure for an author who made his name with best-selling spy thrillers like Eye of the Needle and The Key to Rebecca. So in any sense, did you feel like it was a risk to write that book? My publisher certainly felt it was a risk. They would say, you know, you've had all this success with Nazis and secret agents, and this is uh, about building a church in the Middle Ages? Are you sure? But since it was published in 1989, The Pillars of the Earth has become an international sensation, selling 15 million copies worldwide. In Germany, it was voted the third most popular book behind Lord of the Rings and the Bible. Yes, I was very pleased about that. <laughs> now, 18 years later, Follett has returned to medieval England in the sequel, World Without End. The setting, the same English abbey, 200 years later. It's about the Black Death, the most devastating plague that the world has ever seen, uh, killed between a third and a half of the population of Europe. The plague was like an incoming tide, submerging everyone in its path, unstoppable. The monks had buried a hundred people during Christmas week, and the numbers were still rising. Where would it end? Would everyone in the world die? The Black Death killed so many people, and the church was so powerless to help the victims of the plague that it undermined people's confidence in the church. The sweeping story, with more than 200 characters, took Follett more than three years to write. Behind his desk, he's hung a framed letter from Charles Dickens to a magazine writer. And it's a rejection letter. You probably haven't gotten many rejection letters in your life. <laughs> That's true, I've been lucky. In all, he's sold 90 million books. The son of a Welsh tax inspector, Follett, as a kid, was obsessed with Ian Fleming's James Bond adventures. Boy, I loved those books. They were the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me. You know, he was so cool and tough, and he knew about things that were the most fascinating mysteries to me as a teenage boy. You know, he knew about cocktails. I'd, I'd <laughs> never met anybody who'd had a cocktail. <laughs> By his early 20s, Follett was writing his own spy novels. Give me the film. In 1978, Eye of the Needle broke through to the bestseller list and became a popular film. It made Follett, who's never been shy about enjoying success, a rich man. I've noticed you get called in, in some articles a champagne socialist. You're nodding, you agree? Uh, it's a... It's a, a it's a, a term that I've embraced. <laughs> From his college days, Follett's been active in the Labour Party. Celebration dinner. That's how he met his second wife, Barbara, in 1982. We met at a political meeting. How romantic can you get? <laughs> Ken came in and I thought he was a very arrogant man. 
and very irritating. So I went and bought one of his books so that I could get the measure of the man and sat up all night reading it, The Eye of the Needle. Uh -huh. And then to my embarrassment now, not then, I phoned him and said, you know, you can write. Follett helped write his wife's political speeches when Barbara won a seat in Parliament in 1997, swept in on the Labour Party landslide that brought Tony Blair to power. The British press called her one of Blair's babes. But Follett famously turned on Blair in 2000. In an incendiary article, he accused the British Prime Minister of making malicious gossip a tool of modern British government. So you were saying Blair was responsible I was for saying, it? Tony was responsible for this and he's got to stop it. The Labour feud provided a feast for Britain's political cartoonists. The results now line the walls of Follett's London home. None of them are very flattering, but cartoonists are not a, supposed to flatter us, are they? This is, shows uh, Tony Blair opening a bottle of champagne and the cork is hitting him in the eye and the cork is me. <laughs> Another imagines Follett's written a thriller called The Secret Backstabber. I accused Tony Blair of stabbing people in the back. And one of the interviewers said to me, well, isn't that what you did to him? And I said, no, I've stabbed him in the front. Were you anxious about that article at all? Yes, I was. Did anybody call you up and say, what the hell does your husband think he's doing? Uh, the Prime Minister. You did? Yes. They had, she says diplomatically, a frank 45-minute discussion. When we visited the Follets this summer, Tony Blair was ceding the Prime Minister's job to party rival Gordon Brown. Barbara Follett was named a junior minister in the new government. And this week, Ken Follett will wait to see how the sequel to his most popular novel is received. It's a challenge and it's a risk because it would be very, very bad for me if people said, well, it's not as good as the first one. With the 1,000-page world without end, he's tried to construct a novel as monumental as a cathedral itself. <laughs>